I had planned today to talk about radio surgery for brain metastasis and how the universe has really been expanding rapidly. And I always like that phrase, the universe is expanding, because it makes me think of this old Woody Allen movie, Take the Money and Run, where the little kid version of Woody Allen is there and he tells his parents he's not going to do his homework because he learned in school the universe is expanding. And his parents answer, well, Brooklyn's not expanding, get to work. And, uh, but I think the changes in radio surgery for brain metastasis, as well as for other areas, as you were hearing earlier today, uh, have been very rapid. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and in designing this talk, I sort of went through step by step how we got where we are today with radio surgery for brain metastasis. That has sort of been our first area. We were able to do it there because the head could be immobilized well. Uh, we had very good imaging, first with CAT scan and then MRI scans. And that gets to a lot of the issues that were discussed earlier, how to find the areas that need to be treated and the technologies that need to be utilized to effectively target it. Uh, and so basically, I'm going, I was going to briefly uh, go over the outcome of standard management, uh, you know, the rationale for using radio surgery, just to set the stage for how we got where we are today. Uh, the level one randomized evidence we had, we heard a lot in the earlier talks about the lack of level one evidence for what we're doing now. Uh, data supporting the use even beyond where we have level one evidence, something that's at least becoming more and more common in what I do. Um, and it'd be interesting to hear how other people handle the patient who really has multiple brain metastasis. Uh, the fact that this treatment is not only efficacious, but has a lower side effect profile, something that's been discussed earlier today as controversial in the area of GU tumors, uh, and, uh, and the repeated use of this approach, uh, and also uh, how it can be useful as it can allow other treatments that are needed to proceed without interruption. But basically, this is where things stood uh, back when I started training uh, just a few years ago. Uh, when really all you could do was give whole brain radiation. And the outcome with metastatic cancer was very poor. There were not many good systemic agents. So patients would get their whole brain radiation. The median survival might be four to six months. And, uh, and once brain metastasis were discovered, it was felt that aggressive interventions weren't warranted because nothing would really help. Uh, but then, uh, we had an uh, investigation of the role of surgical resection. And this was, uh, this data came out uh, really af right after I finished my residency. And surgeons at Sloan Kettering at the time would operate on patients with single brain metastasis. And our faculty in radiation oncology would say, that's crazy, these people should just get radiation. You know, why would you put them through uh, surgical resection, uh, surgical resection for this? Uh, and, uh, but then the randomized results became available, and it demonstrated that aggressive management of brain metastasis could improve the outcome, that the survival of patients, at least with a single brain metastasis, was improved if that was controlled. Uh, local recurrence uh, was greatly reduced. I just want to highlight the number that after surgery and whole brain radiation, recurrence in that exact spot was 20%. Whereas with radiation alone, that single brain metastasis would only be controlled about half the time. Uh, and quality of life was better, functional independence was better. Uh, and so this certainly was a, a, a landmark study. However, radio surgery was expanded to include brain metastasis at around this time. It had been developed for a lot of surgical and benign illnesses, but with improved imaging, people were beginning to see if it would work for brain metastasis. And several early studies were done, uh, one, uh, one by uh, Alexander, that reported that local control uh, was just as good with radio surgery for appropriate lesions as it was for resection, two-year local control of about 80%. 
giving us the idea that radiosurgery could substitute uh, for uh, surgery itself. And this was a speaker who came to Johns Hopkins just about the time I was beginning to use radiosurgery for brain metastasis. Very interesting guy from Italy, Professor Gerosa. And he had a very large data set of solitary brain metastasis or people who might have had two lesions treated with radiosurgery, showing excellent long-term uh, local control, at least in the spot that was treated. Uh, and uh, skipping over, because they're, you know, uh, for lack of time, skipping over some of the other studies that were done, uh, but studies were done that showed that adding radiosurgery uh, to whole brain radiation therapy seemed to add very little, except in unique circumstances. And in a situation where MRIs are now easily available, it's certainly possible to follow a patient after a whole brain radiation, and if it fails, to do radiosurgery to a, a growing lesion later on. And so at least uh, in my world, I rarely combine now radiosurgery with whole brain radiation as part of a plan. But the real question that came up was could patients avoid whole brain radiation? People didn't like it. Uh, it certainly is unpleasant to go through in the short term. And there is that risk of neurocognitive injury in the long term. And I remember the first patient with multiple metastasis who I treated uh, with radiosurgery alone was, uh, was a woman who actually uh, uh, was a parent at my daughter's school. And I'd gotten a call, and it was uh, the Friday before a long holiday weekend, I think before Memorial Day, naturally, and I was told uh, there was a patient connected uh, with Johns Hopkins leadership, and she's in a doctor's office now, and she's being told she needs whole brain radiation, but she wants to know if there's an alternative, because she was looking online. Uh, before she starts it, will you see her? I was like, okay, I uh, get the message. I'll delay the start of my holiday weekend. And she was the, and so she was a knowledgeable consumer and uh, insisted on doing it this way, even though we didn't know it would be good. We thought, you have three metastases. There are probably 20 others that we just can't see. And she went ahead with the treatment and then ended up getting treated uh, you know, three times over her uh, four years of survival until spread elsewhere in the body, unfortunately, got her. And to us, it looked like a success. She seemed happy. She uh, finished a graduate degree, wrote a book, and continued to be active with her children. One time when we treated her, she had significant side effects, developed a significant nystagmus that affected her quality of life for a few months, unable to maintain her gaze well. Uh, and I didn't think much about her, although I included her in talks even back then, like I am now. And then a few years ago, uh, someone flagged me down uh, while I was boarding an airplane, and it was her husband. And I told him that, uh, you know, oh, you know, I use your wife's story in our talks, because it looked like a success story to us, but was that your feeling? And he, uh, he, you know, said, no, 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 she never doubted it for a day. She, felt be she at least felt that because she did this, instead of whole brain radiation, she achieved many life goals that she worried she wouldn't be able to had her whole brain been exposed. She felt she was fully interactive with her children till her last day when she took a lot of pain medicine to ease that last day. And that was the motivating factor, really, to explore this. So I think one difference between the situations that we were hearing about earlier, to use radiosurgery in those situations for oligometastatic disease uh, for the therapy of prostate cancer, you might have to demonstrate that it's better. But here, uh, better in terms of efficacy. But here, even if it's not better, it might be more respectful of quality of life and then might be a very rational approach just for that reason. But in any event, since that time, back then we didn't have randomized level one evidence, uh, but there was a lot of pushback against doing this very often with the feeling that randomized data was needed. Uh, and, uh, and there were three randomized trials done, one across Japan, one at MD Anderson, and one in EORTC, which will be on the next slide. But all three showed survival was exactly the same 
whether, radi whether whole brain was treated with radiosurgery or radiosurgery alone was done. Uh, the uh, incidence of new brain metastasis elsewhere in the brain was reduced if whole brain radiation was, need was utilized, generally by about 20%. In the Japan trial, from 60 to 40%. In the MD Anderson trial, from 55% to, uh, to 27%. And that's probably why there's no survival benefit to adding whole brain radiation. For survival to be hurt, you would have to have a recurrence uh, that you didn't detect in your routine follow-up before it caused a big problem. And then it would have to be that whatever you did next for that recurrence elsewhere in the brain didn't work. So for most people, this has little chance of affecting their survival. Uh, but the question was, people wanted you know, good evidence that quality of life was better, just the same. The MD Anderson trial, and I'll come to the data in a minute, the primary objective of that trial was neurocognitive function, and I'll again come back to that in a moment. First, I'd like to turn to the EORTC trial, which was the largest study comparing whole brain alone to local intervention. This included surgery or radiosurgery, depending on the clinical circumstances. Again, the survival was about the same. Uh, distant brain recurrence was reduced by about 20%, from 48% to 33% if whole brain was added. Uh, and uh, on the upper left shows the survival curves, exactly the same as if you made it up. Uh, and uh, on the bottom right shows survival maintaining a, maintaining a performance status, an ECOG status of two or greater, exactly the same as if you made it up. Because one of the questions that skeptics of emitting whole brain radiation had was, well, you're letting people recur, that's probably gonna cause disability. Uh, but it seemed not to, because again, we monitor people very closely. And that matches my, cl match my clinical impression. And again, this slide uh, just highlights that, uh, that uh, on your upper uh, left shows you the local recurrences elsewhere in the brain by omitting whole brain radiation. Uh, the line on the bottom is local recurrence if you just uh, used radiosurgery, I'm sorry, recurrence elsewhere in the brain, distant brain recurrence, if you used uh, radiosurgery with whole brain radiation. And then the yellow line is if you used radiosurgery uh, without whole brain radiation. So again, a marginal decrease in distant failure. People still fail either because you just don't give enough when you're treating the whole brain, it's not safe to give an ablative dose, or because tumor can spread afterwards anyway. But in any event, this didn't seem to impact survival. And because it didn't impact survival, either pathway was appropriate for a person to pick, to take a chance on more brain recurrence or to go ahead with treating the whole brain to reduce the odds of needing to meet with me again to have more radiosurgery. And that really was the balance that people needed to decide. And, it was, oh, and the question is, what evidence do we have that whole brain radiation really impacts quality of life? On the surface, it really seemed to. This was an early survey study done uh, by uh, Dr. Flickinger. Uh, and if people just got radiosurgery, they tended to have few complaints, with again, matched you know, my experience with it. That first woman that I treated without whole brain, you know, we immediately noticed, hey, she was just back to her normal life right away without many side effects at all. And few people who got radiosurgery had big complaints. And I apologize, I'm missing the slide, the key slide that showed what the survey results were for people who got whole brain radiation. But over the, but over the six months to a year afterwards, they tended to have complaints about memory loss, fatigue, sluggishness, and a variety of quality of life effects that were irritants. Uh, and I know that around this time I participated, uh, and I'm adding all this, this, these colorful stories in, because again, we're missing our middle speaker, so I know that I can go, go long today. Uh, but around that time I, was, uh, I had uh, participated in a debate at ASCO about whether it was appropriate to omit whole brain radiation. And, and, uh, 
And the, the question was brought up, do we really have evidence that whole brain radiation affects quality of life? And afterwards, an uh, 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 oncologist came up to me and said, I don't really deal with brain patients very much. You know, what I deal with, very few people are getting brain radiation. But my aunt had whole brain radiation, and things were never the same after that. And that speaker who said there are no long-term effects of this, that, that that really doesn't happen, I, that's just crazy because we all see it happening. But it's good to have evidence. And this was from the MD Anderson randomized trial. And the percentages that you see here uh, are the chances of having decline in these functions, total recall, delayed recall, uh, delayed, uh, delayed recognition. And the chances of a decline at four months were much greater if whole brain radiation was given. The problem with this is that four months isn't very long. You could still be having acute effects of whole brain radiation then. But this trial was stopped because they saw this difference. Uh, and uh, no, I'm sorry, my slides got out of order. This was the survey study that showed the complaints people had after whole brain radiation. And I think this matches what people tell us when we see them in clinic, uh, that not everybody, there are people who feel well, but a lot of people feel that cognitively, you know, things are slow, that their energy just is not quite the same for a long time, if ever. Uh, but then, at the most recent ASCO meeting, NCCTG randomized trial, a large study that also had rigorous testing of neurocognitive function as its primary endpoint was also reported. Uh, and they compared, this, these are preliminary results, uh, again, giving early results at three months after treatment, not yet published, and longer term results have not yet been presented. Uh, but the chances of having decline, cognitive progression, decreases in specific functions like immediate recall, delayed recall, were a lot lower if, whole, uh, if just radio surgery was given. Again, showing better quality of life. Uh, the tumor control was roughly similar, and survival was similar with both arms. This drew a lot of attention and convinced people. This was the Wall Street Journal headline then. And uh, you may not be able to read what it says uh, in that first line of the Wall Street Journal article, but it says the treatment that may be worse than the disease. And then the next one is uh, something I found from MSNBC uh, that also said the same thing. Uh, and so there are some benefits in addition to reducing side effects that may result uh, from omitting uh, whole brain radiation. Early on, we felt it probably is safe not to interrupt systemic therapy, although based on the available data, when people were getting whole brain, we told them you probably need to take a month or more off as of synergistic effects of myelosuppression. This has been observed in lung cancer patients, uh, patients getting uh, uh, prophylactic cranial radiation with radiation, kids getting radiation because they had uh, uh, you know, hematologic malignancies and brain tumor patients where both were given together. And we, and we just started to do this and we just had our manuscript accepted uh, and it should come out soon. And I eliminated most of the slides because uh, I thought time would be an issue. Uh, but there was no uh, signal, uh, no matter which chemotherapy was given, that if we gave radiosurgery during the chemotherapy, generally not the same day, often during the same week, uh, was there any signal for increased myelosuppression? Uh, a weakness is that these chemotherapy regimens were all over the map. This was not a research study. We took the patients as we saw them. But there was no signal that we were making anything worse by treating a small field. And the level of neurotoxicity was what we expected just for radiosurgery alone, uh, with a few percent necrosis rate, and not much incidence of severe grade three or four toxicities. And so we do this routinely now, uh, because uh, the systemic disease control is really what's important to patient survival. Uh, and the next question, uh, so we've established, and this became more popular um, for us and patients, uh, because we established 
with good level one evidence that this was okay to do for up to three or four metastasis, that it allows need of systemic therapy to proceed, and that quality of life was good. And again, at the beginning, when we were just starting to do this, we got major pushback from our oncologists at Johns Hopkins who said, this is crazy, we know you're doing this because it's highly reimbursed and your department wants you to do this. Uh, but then, one by one, they all, when they saw their patient get this and do so well, one by one, they began to say, send patients to me and say, oh doctor, the doctor told me he hopes I could just get radio surgery because that's so much easier. And then the tide really turned and it became popular among the referring physicians also. Uh, so the question is, you know, then what to do with people who had more lesions? This was particularly important when we were using the gamma knife because people would have a frame on and get a scan and we'd find a bunch of small metastasis on the thin cut MRI that we got. Should we treat them or not? And this was one of the first papers about it uh, from uh, Dr. Amendola and the team in Florida. And uh, she's very active in this organization. Don't know if here for this meeting, uh, uh, there, yes. But this was a key paper that got people started at thinking this was correct. And, and, I real, and uh, one of my friends from residency uh, worked with Dr. Amendola, uh, you know, uh, Lori Block, and she highlighted this paper for me and said, you know, in, my, in her experience, this is really good. And they treat people with a lot of metastasis, and then they just get on with their lives, not like whole brain radiation. But uh, other people need to study it. There needs to be more papers. There's so much pushback from oncologists and from the insurers. But then more studies were done. Uh, Penny Sneed at University of San Francisco did this a lot. Uh, but recently, a very key paper came out from Japan looking at up to 1 to 10 metastasis, radio surgery alone, single arm but prospective, over 1,000 patients. Now, it's important to know the eligibility. This was not 10 large metastases. The total volume had to be less than 10 milliliters and uh, the largest less than 3 centimeters in size. Uh, 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 the, sorry, the total cumulative volume, less than 15 milliliters. The largest single met, less than 10 milliliters. So this is the person who may have one sizable lesion, and you find a bunch of tiny ones, which you then treat. Uh, but they found uh, that the survival was unaffected by the number of metastasis. This was okay to do. The blue curve that's a little better are the people who had one metastasis, and we know that they do a little better. But whether you had two or three or 10, was no different. Uh, and so from this, they concluded, with this survival, if it's worth doing it for someone with two or three metastasis, it's worth doing for someone with 10 metastasis. Uh, and uh, again, I can't tell how big it is on your screen, but this is the data from their study, and I just wanted to highlight a few points. Uh, one uh, was that uh, local recurrences uh, were uncommon, and it's difficult to determine because the effects of radiation can mimic local recurrence. But they found that the treatment tended to be effective at the spots that they knew about. And distant recurrence uh, was, uh, was roughly similar, even if there were more metastasis to begin with. It was somewhat lower in that special case of one lesion. It was significantly lower, just about 45% developed a new lesion uh, in their lifetime ahead by two years. Uh, but about two-thirds of patients who had more than one metastasis needed treatment again. And that was not very different whether you had seven or eight or whether you just had two or three. And then uh, they looked at other things you might looked at. Leptomeningeal failure may have been slightly higher if you had 10 lesions but not really that much higher to warrant giving everyone whole brain radiation. It might have been seven or eight percent higher if you had 10 metastases than if you just had one. Uh, and the need for repeat treatment uh, was not much different. The need for whole brain radiation over two years was about 10 percent, no matter how many metastases you had. So now, uh, although 
uh, I'm rarely encouraging it. I still feel qualms about encouraging it when I see someone presenting with seven or eight metastases. Certainly willing to do that now, and patients tend to pick it. And I know uh, that one of the speakers uh, uh, earlier, uh, I think Dr. Davis, brought up chart rounds and needing to justify what you're doing in chart rounds. And a few years ago, it might have been about five years ago, I uh, remember getting paged. I was at Astro, and I got paged by one of our residents saying, oh, you know, in chart rounds, you just treated someone with five metastases with radius surgery alone. And everyone in chart rounds was like, why is he doing that? Give him a call. He shouldn't be doing that. And, and now, you know, there's no pushback, either in chart rounds or from insurers. I don't know what it's like in your community, but now if someone has brain mets, they don't even ask. They just approve it. Uh, whereas... Uh, what state is that? In Maryland? Yeah. Uh -huh. Maybe they, they know of me. They know I'll win the argument. It could be they flag my name. But, we, but, they, but we never really get a call for a, to, or, you know, a peer review, peer-to-peer -peer anymore for that. Whereas years ago, that was just routine. If someone had more than one metastasis, it became a big, uh, a big discussion. Uh, but that woman who they uh, complained about, uh, she was, again, someone I was skeptical about at the time. She was a wealthy woman from Canada, a private banker. And she said, I've heard about whole brain radiation. The most important thing to me is to work and you are going to treat these five. They will not do it in Canada, but here I can come and pay for it, and I will pay for it, and you will do this. And then she, she survived another three and a half years, and it was systemic spread that got her. She did need treatment one more time to the brain. And again, until her last few months when things were turning bad, she worked as a private banker, a high-end job, and played golf with her clients like she wanted. Uh, oh, forward. And uh, another question we have is the strategy of repeat radio surgery. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, and, uh, and our additional, Chethan, why don't you come up to the stage? And our, just in the, just in the nick of time. And uh, the final question we think it's important to explore is now I'm treating people with radio surgery over and over again. And when I discuss this with patients, uh, I discuss with them, uh, you know, is it, uh, you know, uh, when you pick this option, we're probably going to need to treat you again. You're going to see me again, and you know how I am, and this is going to be unpleasant. Uh, and you're going to wait in clinic for hours, but you're going to be doing this uh, over and over again. Is that a reasonable strategy? And we have submitted for publication our patients who we treated over and over again. It's a select group because they already lived long enough to treat a second time. But those patients had a median survival of 25 months. Uh, overall survival from the time of second radio surgery was 13 months. So if you live long enough to get a second radio surgery, that was already a good sign. Probably your systemic disease was controlled well enough that you would survive. So this was a reasonable thing to do. Our use of whole brain radiation was a little higher than the Japanese series, about 25%. But now I think it would be lower. Now that I know this is okay, and again, it's like as came up earlier, the chart rounds issue. Now I don't get pushback from either the oncologist or in chart rounds if I'm just doing this over and over again rather than giving people whole brain radiation. Important was the number of the the, the, and our table on the bottom, table B, was that with our imaging follow-up every three to four months for the first two years and then every six months after that, most lesions are discovered without symptoms. 80% or more we would discover before there was a symptom and just treat them. Uh, and finally, uh, in the era of effective targeted therapy, the use of repeated radio surgery may be more important because people are living much longer, much longer to get the side effects of whole brain radiation. This was recently published, 90 patients with ALK-positive lung cancer treated on ALK inhibitors. The line on the blue on, the, on your left 
is survival in patients who started their ALK inhibitor when they got brain metastasis. And these patients were mostly treated with radiosurgery. And the median survival after brain metastasis was about five years. And on average, people were treated between two and three times to their brain during that period. The red line is if you develop brain metastasis already on the ALK inhibitor, so sort of a failure of that to stop spread to the brain, still median survival was close to three years, warranting aggressive management. And now I'll finish up because we, uh, we do have uh, Chethan to, to follow next. And uh, so the rationale for using radio surgery, even in these situations, it's better quality of life. You can continue systemic therapy. Randomized data supports this in up to four lesions. That was the Japanese trial that allowed four. A very large perspective, well done study, supports this for up to 10 lesions, as long as they're not out of control big. Uh, you can continue systemic therapy. Uh, and you can do this over and over again, and people just continue their lives. They're back at work doing their, their normal things.